What's up everyone? Welcome back to Moonlight Game Devs, a podcast where game developers share the story behind their games and the lessons learned with their fellow indie developers. Today I had a chat with Matt Trobiani, who released the super successful Hacknet, a hacking simulator, and an upcoming sports game, WrestleDunk Sports. I hope you guys enjoy the episode. What's up, Matt? Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, you have a, like, a really interesting background. You're the creator of Hacknet, super popular game. Mm-hmm. But maybe before we go deeper into like that and your upcoming game, WrestleDunk Sports, how about you just give us like an overview of kind of your background, how you got started in like creating games? Um, it depends how far back you want me to go. Do you want to hear right from the start? Sure. Why not? All right. Um, well, I, I started a really long time ago um, developing, uh, I think probably probably how I started was developing custom maps for Warcraft 3. Did you ever play any of the uh, the custom maps in that? That's where Dota came from. No, actually um, not. But I've, from kind of the other podcasts I've heard, um, you're the first one person on this podcast, but love the <laughs> game development podcast I listen to. That's kind of how they get into, got into it. So kind of the early days of modding and, and and kind of getting yeah. the first experience there. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess when I was really young, I also made um, like custom maps for StarCraft, but I got really into it with Warcraft 3 and just uh, hmm. just the way the tools were exposed and the the crazy sort of things you could do with it, um, the way you could build a completely different game uh, out of it was something that was really, I guess, like inspiring. It was really exciting to me. Um, <laughs> so I made a bunch of that sort of thing. Um, I went to university for a computer science degree, and while I was there, I didn't really didn't really register that uh, making games was a job that you could really have. Um, I guess in uh, Australia, South Australia, where I'm from, um, at the time, the the job market for it, if it wasn't wasn't healthy and it wasn't very visible, um, and still I think it's it's quite difficult to get. Uh, full-time working games in australia that um yeah. yeah definitely when i was going to uni it wasn't it wasn't like there were the schools there are now offering game degrees around or anything um but i was just making games sort of recreationally um doing them for fun i helped make a, a fan game for this extremely difficult platformer called i want to be the guy um i was making a bunch of little games and things like that on my own i did a lot of like programming for myself uh during the degree just making I don't know, weird things and tools. Mm. Um, yeah, it wasn't until uh, someone started a game development club at uni that I I started getting like really into it. Um, made uh, made a couple of small games and got a little team together. Um, and yeah, just started from there making projects that got slowly bigger over time. Uh, and eventually one of those projects was Hackman. Yeah, can you like walk us through, um, give us kind of like a, an overview of, of what Hacknet is about? Um, and yeah, maybe for those people listening in the car or whatever, give us like a little bit of a gameplay um, description, I guess. Sure. So uh, it's a hacking simulation game. It's much more about uh, selling the, the, the mood and the experience of um, uh, hacking than it is than I guess you'd find in like most other games where it's not like it, it, it goes into a lot more detail. So it's all played from the command line. Mm-hmm. Um, the actual like a screenshot of the game might just look like someone's like Linux computer. It was um, it was designed to be intentionally really like look really intense and look really serious. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, yeah, the whole the whole direction the game's always traveling in is about um, like selling that selling that reality so you will have to learn how to use a bunch of like terminal commands you'll be like breaking into people's computers and selling their programs and then using them against other people uh, that sort of thing but um yeah the the meat of the game is really that you'll be investigating like a computer you'll run a few commands to see what its security is all about um and then you'll start running your programs breaking that security um checking out all their files, downloading things you want, deleting things you don't want, um, and getting mm-hmm. out of there before the logs catch you, before uh, before your trace finishes. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a hacking game. So I guess, like, a question that I'm sure you get asked a lot, how did you come up with that idea, and how did that kind of evolve? Um, so it actually started in a game jam. There's actually footage out there of 
the 48 hours where I made the HackNet prototype in a game jam. Um, I have recorded my screen for it. So um, so that's off. I can, I can send a link for it if you want to put it in somewhere. Definitely. Basically, I was still at uni and I'd, I'd written this uh, new method for making interfaces. It's actually similar to, I believe, how the old Unity buttons and stuff work. But it's this idea called an immediate mode interface. Um, it's a way that you can make these sort of crude interfaces extremely quickly um, and with no like UI editor or anything. You just type it straight out into the code and it just appears. It's like, it's really quick. Um, it means that it's it's also pretty like quick and dirty because you don't get stuff like scroll bars are really difficult to do with it and like two buttons on top of each other will just like have give you heaps of weird issues. But um, it was a really cool system for really quickly making lots of interfaces. Um, And I did that because I'd been frustrated with uh, a lot of the other interface stuff that was out there where I felt like it was really painful and difficult to make it do some things that I felt should be really simple. Um, So uh, I'd made this weird UI library system um, uh, and I really wanted to try it out and make a bunch of buttons and stuff, but uh, I didn't really have anything to do with it. And, And some friends and I... We're running game jams pretty frequently. Uh, If you don't know what game jam is, uh, like a period of time, usually like 48 hours or seven days. This one was 48 hours uh, where Mm -hmm. you get given a theme and you just have to make a game. Um, So I was doing them all the time with friends. Um, And there was was a a time slot that we'd all agreed on coming up to make make a game in. And uh, it was my turn to pick the theme. And I'd just written this, um, this immediate mode UI system um, so I was extremely selfish and I made the theme um, uh, uh, interfaces. <laughs> nice. um, so uh, I, I had this idea that I was like, okay, I'm going to... I really love the game uh, Uplink, which is sort of like a, a precursor, the original hacking game, uh, precursor to Hacknet. Um, mm-hmm. And I really love that game and the mood of it. Uh, but I also wanted to make uh, something more modern that used the terminal so I had this rough idea going in that I was going to make a hacking game. Um, it was going to be, have a terminal, but the uh, there would also be this sort of display window where you click buttons. And basically what the buttons do is just auto-type something into the terminal for you and press enter. So um, there'd be different like context-sensitive buttons. And the idea of the game just like that I worked out at the start was like, okay, I'm going to have a terminal. It's going to be about hacking. And there's going to be buttons there that do things but the buttons are like a trap. You're supposed to type it out because that'll make you better at the game. But the buttons are there to sort of get you started. And that was just the idea. So I just started putting windows together. I made a terminal I put on the right, made your button thing, put it in the middle, made a little map so you could click around and like be like, oh, I'm going to hack into this computer now. So there were a bunch of things to click. And like before I knew it, I had it all just, just, it all just appeared. Uh, like, um, like the real substance of the game just just came out of nowhere right before me, um, uh, just out of those core elements. The rest of it uh, seemed to like flow very naturally from those first few decisions. Um, and uh, yeah, you can see it. You can see it happen in the, the game jam footage. It's kind of wild, actually. It, it looks like I, yeah. I know what it's going to look like before I'm like, like when I start, like I'm, like I'm just building it out one thing at a time. And I'm like, oh, this goes here, this goes here, this goes here, and then we're done. And it just it just comes out looking like um, like the first version of Hackman. It looks very similar in the to the final version. Um, so it was a pretty pretty amazing forty eight hours. Yeah, but um, it just came to this the, a couple of rough ideas and a couple of principles, um, and then really holding really closely to those uh, throughout the entire development and holding really closely to the idea of everything that I built into the game was about furthering that feeling of uh, like like you're a cool hacker doing hacker jobs um, and anything that made you feel more like that got kept and everything anything that didn't got cut um, and it just stayed really closely to those ideals for the whole development and uh, I think that served me really well. No, that's, that sounds awesome. Like the fact that you had that ability to create like your vision in 48 hours or at least the prototype of it, the mm. general idea. Yeah. Yeah, just to be clear, the full game took like three and a bit years to make. It took a really long time to take that um to like yeah. a finished product at that that stage of it, it it looks like the game's like totally done after 48 hours 
you know, just <laughs> change a few textures and you'd be good. But it's uh, there's a lot more involved than that. No, I can imagine like the complexity of. I mean, you just mentioned there, like you have the buttons pressing, and but you also the user can input certain commands and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Was there like a point at where you know you you realize like certain commands, uh, you know, were were going to make it in the game or not? And I guess it's not like a real Linux terminal. Mm. Uh, where you need some special expertise, how do you kind of make that accessible and un like easy to understand for someone who's maybe not a hacker, like not a hacker, but like a Linux user? Yeah, so I think there are like two parts to that question. Uh, the first is like, what do you decide to put in and what do you decide to cut, and uh, and then how do you make it accessible? Um, mm -hmm. And so there, there are like there are two things there, and I'll answer the first one first, which is that I knew I couldn't add every. Linux command, because there are loads. Um, but there's something interesting about um, those commands. When you type in a command into a terminal, what you're actually typing is a program name. Um, so if you type, like, say, ls space something, that actually like runs a program, and that program's name is ls. You just, you just don't really recognize it because it doesn't have like .exe at the end or whatever. Um, so when I was making the Hacknet programs, I knew I wanted to make it in such a way that when you typed in the uh, like something into the terminal, it ran a specific block of code that was its own little standalone program that did the thing, um, which meant that I could have very like Linux-like and very powerful um, commands in there. So setting that up, it, it all it's all like quite a bit more complicated um, to make it all work like this than it might just appear from the terminal. But um, I think building it in that way that was realistic was one of those things that was really important to me to you know further the immersion like you want people that are familiar with these systems to feel at home with this simulated one um, the problem is you can't add every command because there are so many and some of them are really complicated um, so basically my decision for that was like i just did whatever was convenient and i did all the ones that i know and the, the ones that i care about um, and if any were really difficult to implement and that i didn't think many people would use i just got them um, yeah that makes for, sense <laughs> yeah as for making it accessible this was probably the hardest thing in the whole game's development. And this took like a process of years. But basically, I'd, I'd, I've built this tutorial, I'd say maybe maybe like 70 times. Um, it's It was a nightmare. I just, I took it to some conventions early on uh, with the tutorial and no one beat the tutorial. They were like, they'd be like, I just, I just spent like, it would have been like three or four days and I just watched hundreds of people play it and nobody beat the tutorial and it was just agonizing. And I'd, I'd been ages designing it being like, this can't be any easier. This is like the simplest thing that can be done in this system and nobody could do it and nobody wanted to. Um, and I think it's an interesting thing where like I look back on it and I know that if I hadn't found answers to those problems, I'd just been like, oh, I'll just release it anyway and you know, people online will find it. I know the game would have tanked. Um, yeah, and it was just it was like it was a vital thing to do, even though it was really hard. So, um, oh, yeah. took a bunch of notes, um, thought about it really hard, uh, like made a bunch of changes, came back, uh, did another convention. You know, one person passed it. I'm like, okay, cool. Like, made notes about it everywhere where other people stopped. Um, like, and did the process a bunch of times. Um, showed a bunch of other people, and just like just like versions and versions and versions and tests and tests and tests. Um, and yeah, I learned a lot about tutorials, learned a lot about how people uh, think and react to these sort of systems. Um, I did a talk on it for GCAP, uh, Games Connect Asia Pacific uh, in Australia, I think it was two years ago now. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. Uh, I could talk about tutorials forever now because I, I got way too deep into them with, uh, with how hard it was to make a good Hacknet tutorial. But um, I think the gist of it was... Like the main lessons that I learned for making that sort of thing approachable was to realize that your tutorials not about not as much about teaching your player how to play your game as it is making the player feel like they can play your game. Like this is something they can be good at. This is something that they can do. Um, and once once they've internalized that, then you can spend your first couple of missions sort of like feeding them the more mechanical information. Um, I think what you want from the tutorial for games that are like complex like this is to just start the players out with a good experience 
and start them out feeling like they this is something that they can do, something that they can understand. Um, because if you don't do that, they're not even going to engage with it. Um, like there were there were times during the tutorialization of this game where I just you can't understand how like this step is not possible. Like the screen has nothing except a big button on it that has like a big blue outline that's like flashing, and it says "click me to proceed." And the player is looking at this screen. There's nothing else on it. The player is looking at this screen and just telling you, "I don't know what to do." And you're like, "I, I don't know. I don't know how. What, what are you supposed to do from there to make that easier?" Like, yeah. there's there's no way forward. And the the problem isn't that your tutorial step is too hard. Like, people are actually capable of doing things that are very complicated very quickly. The problem isn't that your tutorial is too hard, or that they're too stupid. Uh, which is a trap that I think a lot of designers fall into with this, where you think like you give them an easy task and they say, I can't do this. And they say, oh, you must be dumb, right? And I think that's the wrong way to look at it. Usually I think people get into that state because they feel like they shouldn't be able to do whatever the task you're asking of them is. Um, and this is particularly bad for Hacknet because the big goal of the whole interface's design, the way every screen looks is intimidating on purpose. So this was particularly <laughs> difficult. But um, yeah, a lot of the tutorialization was you had to very clearly first communicate to the player that this was something that they could do. Um, and then you can teach them like very slowly over a longer period of time, like how the minutiae of it works. I mean, what you just said there, I think was such a great insight there also in like human psychology, because I mean, I'm a, I'm a software developer as well. And I use mm. Linux actually on my like normal laptop, mm. the one I use personally. And when I started out, you know, just like you said, using the terminal, it's something that's just intimidating because it looks intimidating. I think like once you get used to it, you understand the underlying concepts. And, yeah. you know, like you said, it's just running programs. You just type in the name of a program, it runs. Yeah. That's not that complicated or that intimidating or scary even. But I think just like the look of it, you know, I guess feeling like a hacker because you've got the little terminal. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it scares people at the beginning. Like, I think you really um, nailed it there, and like, super impressed by the fact that you actually were managed. You like managed to make the game. You know, ma I, I don't. I'm not sure if it's fair to say it's mainstream, but really have a wide audience appeal there. Yeah, that that's actually pretty like still insane to me. It, that doesn't make any sense, right? That I like that. Did it actually, I mean, it, that it's gone as far as it has. I, I actually thought like all the way up to release that it was going to be super, super niche. But yeah, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it is. I mean, I didn't even know how deep you kind of went into making it like an actual terminal game because admittedly I've not played it, but mm -hmm. honestly, it sounds like you really went really far. And the more I listened to the interview, kind of you explaining it, like it actually is with Linux commands and you're kind of emulating the many parts there. It just, it was like more and more amazing to me. Um, so yeah, incredible. Um, what I want to talk about is kind of, you know, you made that Game Jam game. Mm -hmm. how, how did you kind of transition into, I guess, you know, given that you've mentioned you worked on it for three years, did I read that correctly? Yeah, something like that. So I um, I finished the Game Jam game um, and I, I really, <laughs> this is an embarrassing part of the story, but I really love the game. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to keep working on it because I, I like I really really liked what I'd made. Uh, I thought it was really really cool and really fun. Um, uh, mm -hmm. So I was playing around with ideas about how to make like a campaign within that, um, and like what sort of like structure of like like missions would be good. What sort of like storytelling mechanisms would be good. Um, so I was doing a lot of experience with that. I I made a sort of you know, it was like a demo version a first version of it um and i released it on indie db um this was mm -hmm. back when indie db was like a bit bigger um that site's really cool um so i released the game now um i was like hey like making this thing i had a message at the end of it that said um i'm not working on this project anymore i had my dream project at the time and i was like All right, i'm gonna go make that now that i've done my little like hacking demo game thing so i was like that game Zero commercial like appeal won't won't work. I'd like to make a game that like people like that people would like to buy, and I don't think this could ever be that. Um, and I was you know an idiot, but that's uh that's what I what I what I was saying. So I did that. I was like, I'm going to work on this other game, which was obviously because this was back in what I don't know 
2010, no, 2009, something, ages ago. Um, this was back then. So, like every other indie developer on the planet, I was like, all right, I'm going to make a puzzle platformer like Braid. <laughs> Um, uh, and that'll be my ticket to indie fame. I'm going to do it. It's going to be great. So I was dumb and I was like, all right, that's going to be my big dream project. I'm going to make that. I'm going to put this hacking game uh, out there for free on IndieDB. It's going to be great. So I had a message saying basically that at the end of the game. And uh, yeah, like a whole bunch of people played it. I think like 30,000 people played that um, demo, wow. which is like, I don't know, which back then and for me, like having never really you know, made it, anything super significant before that was amazing um yeah i thought it was incredible and i got a whole bunch of emails about it saying like hey, you should keep working on this game i actually got a bunch of emails like that after the game had actually already been made and released on steam which was really nice gonna be like, oh yeah i already did that it's out on steam already <laughs> got another sale <laughs> yeah um so that was that was really cool um but i was still convinced that i uh i need to make this other game and so I was making that for ages, but that really felt like I was like forcing myself to to make it. And I got this like test where I think um, if I'm not sure what I should be working on, you just take a shower. And what you think about is probably going to be what you're interested in. And basically when I, when I had like sort of spare time, the sort of things that I was thinking about were like, oh, I want to make this cool server for my hacking game. I want to do this other thing in my hacking game. I want to do this other weird stuff um and i felt like i was forcing myself to make the other game mm -hmm. and it took me a really long time to realize that that meant that i wanted to make the hacking game that, as dumb as that sounds you know, like that was the game that i was more interested in it seems really obvious when you say it like this but that's actually it, it took me a really long time to like really come to terms with that you know i was working i was working a job and i was making like software had my software job um and i was making uh making hack that on the side uh, and working mm -hmm. like trying to also work on this other game on the side so you know i was traveling yeah, a bit. The work. yeah so you know just taking time where i could to continue working on this thing um and it grew and grew and grew and then um yeah eventually got done i guess somehow did you actually um continue to work on multiple projects next to your full-time job or did you decide eventually to focus just on hacknet um i i did do multiple projects at once um like wow. alongside my job for a while but eventually settled on doing just hacknet for a fair bit of it i was uh, i was working like three days a week and i'd spend the rest of the days working on like various games and things i think still back then i hadn't really thought that like i like i could be a full-time game developer it was just something that i was doing fun like doing because i because i loved it and yeah so it like it's hard but it's something that I was doing for fun, you know. It, it felt like a hobby, um, and I think it's like yeah. it's kind of more serious now. But um, yeah, yeah, those times are great. There was definitely a point at which I was like, okay, I'm like all in on Hackman now. Um, it's hard to really say when that was because I think it was like a gradual process. But um, yeah, I think once I hit that point, it became much easier to start thinking about it as like, all right, this is a thing that I need to finish and I need to be able to someday release. Um, and yeah, unless you like taking a game really seriously, it's easy to sort of develop in a way that that never happens. You know what I mean? Yeah, working on like taking up different projects, you know, working on too many things. Mm. You know, for me, it's like it's always you got to kind of have a focus at some point at mm. the latest because otherwise you're not invested enough in, in, in the thing, like you said, the thing that you should be working on to really make it good and, and actually make some significant process. I mean, a part of it is if you're just doing it for fun, there are a lot of parts of making a game, especially like a really good game and a really like polished game, um, which, you know, Hacknet sort of isn't. Like that's not a super polished game. Um, but there are a lot of parts of making making like a good game that are just not very fun at all and that are really annoying and yeah. really difficult. Like, God, I hate making settings menus. Ugh, <laughs> every time. Every time, I, every time I get to the point of the game where I have to make... Um, I have to make the, the thing where it lets you set your resolution and then it has to have a little box that sets it back if you don't do any inputs <sighs> for 15 seconds. I'm like, I'm just going to throw this project out the window. I hate making this. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm already getting a headache hearing about it. Oh, it's the worst. Yeah. Every time. Yeah. Is, I think that's really where the saying comes from, like the last 20% of 
take like 80% of the time because, yeah, it's the stuff that no one wants to work on and nah, it yeah, feels insignificant. Like that, the last 10% is the last 90%. Oh, so it yeah. Just gets, it's oh, so yeah. crazy, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I mean, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, before we move on to mm-hmm. uh, WrestleDunk Sports, just like I noticed that you work with Fellow Traveler, which is like a really mm-hmm. big um, indie narrative games publisher. Are they really big now? I mean... They're pretty big. They're like yeah. I mean, they're they're like followers on, on on Twitter, I guess, which is pretty yeah. big for an indie indie publisher. But um, <laughs> I, I'm sure your game contributed to it. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe I um like I, I know like I know all the fellow travel people like quite closely, and like I've, I've hung mm-hmm. out with them a bit. It's uh it's really cool to hear them described as a really big publisher actually, because they were you know they were, they were still like really up and coming when I first signed with them. Right. Um, they're all great. So, yeah, I, I'd actually, I don't know, I haven't heard them described that way before. It's it's really neat. But, yeah, like, um, maybe you can walk us through, like, what was that like, you know, speaking to them and kind of how did you guys collaborate? I guess if you don't mind sharing that. <laughs> um, I, have a, I have a really obnoxious answer for this one that I really like. But um, I feel like if you want to get published, you just win yourself an award and then they come to you. Right. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I, won a, I won some game design award for, um, for Hacknet. And um, like the fellow traveler people, they were surprise attack at the time. Um, then they rebranded to fellow traveler now. Um, yeah, they were there and sort of talked to me about um, like signing on with them. Um, and uh, yeah, like I just went from there. That was actually a weird time. Um, so when I signed with them, they were not a narrative games publisher. They were um, they were called surprise attack, and they they were sort of Australian games focused. And they had published a whole bunch of different things. And the things that were currently in their label uh, were like all over the place. Um, a lot of local multiplayer games, stuff like that, um, which weirdly WrestleDunk is now like the sort of game that they would have <laughs> loved back then. But um, yeah, anyway, I got, I got it back to front with them. But yeah, I think when I, when I was talking to them about it, a lot of the staff there really didn't understand the game. Like, it really wasn't the sort of game that they liked. Um, there was really only one person on the team, uh, Steve Heller, that really liked the game and really fought for it, really pushed for it, um, and sort of, like, got the rest of the uh, fellow Traveler team on board with publishing it. It was it was really interesting. I, I really... I think publishers in the indie space are in a strange spot because... Like a, a lot of it is like, it's like all right. They'll they'll say they'll they'll help you with your your marketing and stuff, which they will. Like they'll help you build out your important assets and help you make your trailer and help you like make your Steam page and all that sort of thing. But I don't think that for a lot of games, as much as marketers will tell you it is, I don't know how how important a really good Steam page actually is. Like I think that's actually quite hard to measure. Yeah. I think like a good trailer is really important, but but how good of a trailer is important? I think a lot of it's just in like the you know the game concept or the game is itself. Yeah, I think that people are really bad at predicting what game is going to do well. Um, so it was a weird time, um, and fellow travel has been like great for me, of course. And I think they're all wonderful, um, but I will say with that. I don't think indie publishers are for everyone and you should think like really clearly about like what you're getting out of the deal. I actually think by far the most valuable thing that a publisher gets you isn't like, you know, marketing or anything. It's just that they have more access to the platforms. So like the best thing about my deal with fellow traveler is that they could talk to steam um, and get me in those like front page deal slots way more than I could, even if, my game was exactly the same and had exactly the same success. Um, just because when they get an email from a publisher, that represents like an email that represents like loads of games. And they just simply don't have the time to respond to emails from everyone in the world. And I probably wouldn't have thought to email Steam and ask for one of those slots, but they did. And that was really valuable. Um, so that sort of expertise in dealing with platforms is in many cases not a replaceable thing and that's one of the best things you can get from working with the platform uh with the publishers thanks for being so so candid there and like giving us the honest advice there i've, I've seen it a lot like as you do with like people in the indie space as well mm. whether they're publishers or not not being really honest about kind of the marketability of their game like you said you know 
not being honest with like will this game really stand out on the store or they might not know yeah it's like yeah the problem like publishers like you think about them as an entity but like they're actually just a bunch of people and like as much as it is as it is their job to like you know pick the winners like they just can't like i don't i don't think anyone mm-hmm. knows for sure which game's going to do well and which game isn't uh, i think mm-hmm. some people have better guesses than others but um yeah i think it's i think it's hard to know and i think they're just like doing their best as well i, I don't think publishers are really out there being you know predatory that often um, i mean at least in my experience they're just doing their best and um it's really got to be up to the developers whether they uh they think that the deal that they're getting with the publisher is worth it um especially because some developers think that they're going to get a publisher and that'll solve all their marketing problems and they're going to make a bunch of money and i I just that's just not true like you can very easily show that that's not true by just looking at how most publishers have like most of their games will sync like it kind of has to because like indie hits are rare yeah i mean yeah it's, this, it's kind of a zero-sum game like mm. if someone's not if someone's people are playing a certain game then you know they're not playing other games yeah yeah thanks so very much for sh- for sharing already all that great information there also on, on like your experience with pu- publishing side there but i guess we you know this time you're self-publishing mm-hmm. uh Wrestle Dunk Sports. Can you tell us a little bit about you know that game and what it's all about? We've not really spoken about it yet. Yeah, so that's that's my new game. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's on like deliberately as like radically far away from Hacknet as I could make something. It's like the complete opposite, uh, where Hacknet's all about immersion and um, like the feeling of it and the like the narrative. Wrestle Dunk's all about the the mechanics um, and like. We're hacking it's all single player. This one's uh, all multiplayer all the time. Um, it's uh, it's a party game, sort of um, online and local multiplayer collection of four sports. Um, you can play with like like two players or eight players, um, like either one v one or two v two, or like up to four v four, or like any combination of those as you want. You can play one v seven. And like the current sports are uh, wrestling, volleyball, smash ball, and fencing. Yeah, it's just a lot of fun. It's all about um, designing games that are super tightly designed, uh, very easy to pick up, and um, that all have like quite a high skill ceiling. Um, yeah, it, they're, they're designed. It, it's hard to express what's um, what's good about the way this game is made. Um, without having you play it but um which is why i think this game's gonna be very difficult to market but uh, it's made completely deterministically with this uh, like rollback networking system behind it that basically there are no decimal points in the whole code base it's all ints and all the values are super tight it always runs 240 frames per second uh behind the scenes even if it can't render that fast um uh, all inputs are like frame one as low like input latency as it it possibly can be um and yeah just having that that crispness of control um that like strong like feedback when you do things um and then just making all of the games very like very minimalist in their design where like the game's not like bogged down by trying to give you too many options to stretch out some mechanics that should have been like a like a short little thing because i could really get away with making games that were designed to be very like tight and like like clean almost game jam game sized experiences Mm -hmm. that were all designed about like really getting into like the competitiveness and the mechanics there um and i can get away with doing something that's that like sort of clean because i don't need to stretch it any more than i think it benefits from because i have like four of them right Um, yeah yeah so i really love those games that are that are like super tightly designed that are like very raw and their mechanical um their mechanical feel and like learning about the mechanics um and how those things work and not feeling like oh and now we need to add like 30 different characters that all have their own like weird quirks that sort of muddy up the play space um i really like games that have like that like a really like small set of rules and really like really few buttons and very like tight controls so you can like really just like see what everything does and every combination of everything um and i feel like a lot of games like just to 
get to a product size that's commercially viable, they need to add too much stuff around it that I think like messes with that. Um, yeah, so I wanted to make this game that had just like that solved that problem by having just like four of those games in like a like pack. Interesting. I want to talk a little bit about like those design constraints, or I should say actually development constraints you mentioned there, like that you mm -hmm. didn't use any floats in the code base. Was that kind yeah. of like a byproduct or something that, you know, like a byproduct of your kind of initial design? Or was it something that you figured out worked to give you that game feel that you were going for? Yeah, so that was a consequence of like, nobody nobody would do this by choice. It's like makes, <laughs> making the game really difficult. But um, it's a consequence of the networking model that I wanted to use. So we, like a lot of the work in Resident has been put into, like this is like a lot of the development of the whole thing is been put into making this a really strong uh, multiplayer like platform. So basically like all of the sports run on this like multiplayer platform that's built for it. Um, do you know much about like uh, networking models and like fighting game multiplayer? Fighting game multiplayer, no, but I think networking models, uh, I probably understand quite a few things. Uh, yeah, so the problem with fighting game multiplayer is that uh, you can't use a lot of other models because no, you can't use a lot of the techniques that you use to make a, say, a first person shooter feel good because you need it, you need to, like, usually the windows between like actions being like say like blocked in street fighter or something are much smaller than the actual travel time of the packets so you can't like ha have a system where somebody presses kick and then like it waits for the packet to get to the server and the server's like okay he's kicking now and if the other person wants to block they have to like get the packet from the server that says the person's kicked then press block and then have that packet get to the server as well because that means that like your dominant strategy just becomes like always attack because you know that there is no like mathematical way that the block packet can get there in time, even if the person oh. wants to block the attack, right? Um, there are like ways around that where you can like you can do like delays and things. Like uh, the way um, Smash Ultimate does it is that uh, your inputs are like delayed, which is why the um, the online feels like muddier than the local like playing locally. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you see like the, the online like freeze while it catches up. Um, there are a bunch of techniques to sort of get around these problems, but um, there is one which is generally regarded as being the best. Um, the problem is that it's, it's the hardest to implement. Um, this is, I mean, in my opinion, it's the best, but it's um, full deterministic rollback netcode. And basically the way this works is you synchronize your clocks uh, right when you start a game and then you send your inputs to each other like directly They're like no no middleman you just like have, like throwing inputs down the pipe as quickly as you can get them there so the buttons you press on the controller mm -hmm. and whenever your inputs do everything locally as soon as you press them so because your clocks are synchronized if you press kick you you kick on like that exact frame there's no delays nothing um yeah and then whenever you get a button press from over the network, like from someone else, it rolls your entire simulation, like the entire game backwards in time to when they really press that button in like real earth time. It puts their button press in and then re-simulates all the way back to the present. Right, so like syncing up the animation, so it looks like, you know, mm -hmm. maybe the mm -hmm. kick that would otherwise take a few milliseconds longer, it's already in, in that yeah, part yeah. of the animation, so, for example. Yeah, so for their perception, um, your moves have less wind up but yeah. all of their inputs and your inputs are actually like local, if that makes sense. So yeah. like basically the problem now becomes um, whoever actually, if you actually pressed block like at the right time in the real world, you will block that kick 100% of the time guaranteed, uh, like regardless of network conditions, which for like fighting games is really desirable. Um, like there's always problems with it. Um, for example, like uh, if you don't get someone's input for like a whole second or a two, um, they'll like jump to somewhere completely different on the screen because they have to go back a whole second in time and then put in one full second of inputs. And like that could be like anything, right? Um, the thing is you do get to put your inputs in at the same time. It's just there, there are problems with both models. The The real technical challenge in this is that you need to build the game in such a way that you can snap backwards and forwards in time uh, like hundreds of times a second, um, which is very complicated uh, for a couple of reasons. The biggest one being um, there's 
floating point non-determinism or floating point drift. This means that like if you have um, so like imagine the number like one divided by three. The answer to that is like point three 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 three, and those num- those point threes go on forever in like math. But in a computer, you don't have like infinite RAM or infinite memory. Those point threes have to stop somewhere, and then what's the number at the end? Um, yeah. Is it like point two or like point four or what? And like and then and how many threes is that down the line? Um, and this will change from like operating to operating system, computer to computer. Like your phone might give you a different result than like you know, your laptop or whatever. This is like, it, the actual problem is a little bit different than this, but this is just a way of understanding it. Um, this means that when you're doing like math with decimal points on a computer, the results will actually drift a tiny amount uh, between devices and computers. But if you're snapping back in time and re-simulating forward in time, uh, like really often, these little these little changes can actually like, can actually completely change the state of things on your computer. So if you go back in time and you play the exact same inputs back, if you were on the very edge of a platform, you could recalculate it such that you've actually fallen through the platform this time. And this is called desync, which is where like uh, going backwards and forwards in time give you different results. Um, and this is like totally unacceptable. Right. There are there are ways of doing this, but it's very difficult to do this between two different computers. Um, or even like in Resodunk's case, like it's going to come out on Switch as well, and we'll have like ideally crossplay between Switch and any computer on the planet. And you just cannot guarantee that they'll evaluate the same floating point numbers the same way, right? Right. Um, which means you've got a big problem. <laughs> so um, there are numbers that computers can calculate that are guaranteed to always have the right result, um, which are whole numbers. They're called integers. Um, which is like they don't have any decimal points because like one plus one is always two and there's no there's no question mark on the end about it. It's always exactly two. Uh, I thought it would be like a fun programming challenge to build this entire foundation and networking system um, on a completely deterministic foundation. Um, so it's only integers. Um, and yeah, I just thought I'd build all the games on that. Uh, and then I can use this cool rollback networking model, um, and we'll have like really unusually good netcode. That's like, um, yeah, that all these games can use. And I'll build all the games out of this um, like int-based system. Uh, since I'm building it that way, uh, I can actually get away with paying a lot more attention to say so instead of this thing taking uh, I don't know like 0.5 seconds. Um, and since I was doing all of this networking stuff anyway, I could pay a lot of attention to things being like, instead of taking 0.5 seconds, it takes exactly 120 frames. So everything's like very consistent. And you always jump on like the frame, you press jump. Um, you always get feedback from that like on frame. Um, yeah, just paying a lot of attention to like the way effects work and stuff. There are a lot of crazy problems with how this all works that were uh, very annoying and difficult because they all involve like, you know, discarded alternate realities and like time travel and junk like that that you shouldn't have to think about in normal programming. But um, yeah, it was it was fun to work with. That's so fascinating. Like, thanks for taking us through all that, you know, technical behind the scene <laughs> going on there. It sounds really, really complicated, but also fascinating. I think you explained it really well there, especially, you know, that reasoning there for using all numbers. Yeah. <laughs> Are you still develop like sort of developing this game? Uh, no, I have a, a network engineer, Jamie Williamson, that's working on it with me. Um, I'm doing all of that stuff that we were talking about there, and I designed and built all the games. But um, Jamie's working on uh, the the packet transference layer of the networking. I don't make my own music either. My music, right. music's made by um, Chris Larkin, who did the Hollow Knight soundtrack, and oh, um, yeah, and yeah. Uh, like Two Mello, who did uh, a really amazing uh, jazz radio feature tribute album that I really liked. So. Um, yeah, Two Mel, I did the wrestling track and the trailer track. Cool. Um, oh, and the art is done by Jason Pammon, who I just sort of like commissioned the uh, backgrounds to be done by. He's great too. Cool. Yeah, I guess uh, you mentioned there that you felt like, you know, the game was hard to market. I think that's what you said. So mm-hmm. what has been your kind of experiences and attempts so far? And, you know, what is your kind of strategy for the future? I don't know when this game is going to get released, but mm. maybe you can give us an idea of that as well, like leading up to the launch 
I, I'm not sure how much I trust myself on this feeling because I felt the same way about Hacknet and that went pretty well. But um, I do feel like I have a better grasp on you know the the market and the state of the market at the moment. Um, and I do think that party games like this are a bit of a hard sell at the moment. Like the competition for them is quite tough. Um, and while I think that Resident has a lot of really good qualities that a lot of other games don't. I don't think those qualities are particularly marketable ones. Um, so, like, the qualities that I think are really marketable are like, oh, the game, like, looks really good. Um, or, like, it has, like, really cool characters. Um, or the gameplay is immediately understandable. Or especially another really good one is that when the game is very cooperative, I think that the, those games do quite well at the moment. Because, um, like, Undercooked blew that whole thing wide open, right? Right. But WrestleDunk, the way it appears and the way it looks um doesn't really do those things quite well like the the characters are quite like basic and the backgrounds are reasonably like flat even though i think the characters look really nice and uh the backgrounds look really nice and the important thing is that they both play really nicely uh together like the backgrounds service the game very well um and the characters serve the game very well and they, the game plays well those things don't immediately jump out uh, of a trailer or like of a steam page I, I just i think the game's going to be tough to sell um i don't think what's good about it is immediately apparent and what's interesting about it isn't immediately apparent i think uh i think the current strategy is to just throw a bunch of money at the twitch bounty system and then pray uh i don't really know what else to do but um i'm, I'm still thinking about it what is the twitch bounty system I think you can just put a pool of money in and then people can play the game on Twitch to take a oh, part of, like okay. a piece of that, like a slice of the money. Um, uh, as for how close it is to, to launch, um, we're kind of being a bit screwed by that at the moment where to, to go into certification for Switch, uh, which the game's going to launch on. Uh, you need your online servers, like our matchmaking server needs to be like security certified. But oh, the, no. the corporation that does security certifications is closed due to COVID uh, and it's unknown when they're going to open again. So we can't get our server certified, so we can't submit to Nintendo Cert, which is unfortunate. Um, the game's close. Uh, I think we still can benefit from the extra time with it. And uh, yeah. it's yeah. not like the game's going to be done at launch. I think one of the really cool things about WrestleDunk that I haven't really spoken about much before is that as a like a, a platform for games like this. The good thing about it is the technology behind it, like the, the foundational parts, like how the games connect and it's got consistent characters and it's got really good networking and it's got really good support for like drop in, drop out, all controllers, that sort of thing. Um, and like that's the good stuff and the actual building of the sports is kind of the easy bit and the fun bit as long as you have a good design for them, which you know is also the hard part. But yeah, if the game does all right, it'd be really fun to just patch in new sports whenever I think of a good one. I think the game has a really interesting potential future. Um, if it turns out that it launches and like this sort of thing is what people want. Um, so it has like a, it has like a fun, a fun plan for where it could go if it does do well, but who knows? Yeah. Like, thanks so much for, for being honest there and, and sharing that. I feel like, um, yeah, the, there's like a lot of annoying things that can sh show up, like the security, security server, security um, certification, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. Like I know that Google does that similar thing. If you want to use, for example, like Gmail, then they mm -hmm. will ask you to do pay like twenty k for them to do a security audit. Yeah, <laughs> and all these other annoying things. So yeah, it's like yeah, these things are something that are hard to foresee as well. But <laughs> hopefully, it all go it goes well. I, you know, it looks like you're doing a great great work so far. Let's get kind of round to a few hot seat questions what motivates you to work on your game um i love making games uh, I, I actually don't know what i'd do if i if i wasn't working on games i like whenever i have time off almost all of it spent about thinking about various games games i want to make games i'm currently making that kind of leads perfectly into the next question which is what game would you be making if it wasn't for this one what's one of those games that you're thinking about making uh I'd probably be making a game that's exactly like um, Link's Awakening because I think that art style and 
uh, like the the bones of that combat system are super super cool, and I think adventure game style thing in that sort of style would be real fun to make. Cool. And then finally, what is the best game development and or business advice you ever received? Oh, um, the seat's too hot. I'm not sure. We'll turn around. What is the best game development advice you would give someone? Uh, I'd say make a smaller game and ship it first. I think. <laughs> All right. So I um yeah I made a I I released another game on Steam before Hacknet and I didn't don't really want to talk about it because I'm not super proud of it. But um I think finishing and releasing a game is really difficult um and much much bigger and harder of a task than most people think. Um and I'd say before you make this game you care deeply about, I'd say you've got a lot of mistakes that you're going to make and make them all in a game that is smaller <laughs> and that isn't going to emotionally destroy you if one of these mistakes brings your beloved project down. Honestly, I think that's that's fantastic advice there. Yeah. Oh, I've I've just thought of uh the best <laughs> game development advice I've ever received. Okay. Um and it was um it was don't try so hard to make something different, just make something that's good. Um and I think the more I think about it, the more it the more it becomes true. Um right. where it's uh I think people may do things differently not because it's better but because they feel like they they can't do something the same way like so people will be making platformers like they're making like a 3d platformer like a mario and they feel like they whenever they're describing it i'm just waiting for them to say like but the twist <laughs> is and like i don't care about the twist i just i just want you to make a good thing um yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's I think it's really good advice. Like, stop stop trying to be so different and just make something really good. Because in the process of making something that you think is really good, it will become very different to everything else. Usually, um, yeah. And I think that's different than like copy something. Like, don't copy. Just make something <laughs> that is good. Like, if you want to make a game, make sure your jump is as good as Mario's jump. You make a sword swing. Make it as good as I don't know who's got the best sword swing. I think the Breath of the Wild sword swing is pretty good. That's the best advice I've ever gotten. Yeah, and it's it's not easy advice to follow, but I think it is good advice. So, where can people you know get in touch with you and find out more about your games? Like, if you want to like plug anything here at the end of the show, uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, the best way to keep up with what's going on in my games is by following my Twitter. Um, I don't post very much there, but you hear about my games there. It's uh, at Oran at O R A N N on Twitter. Um, I'm hanging out in the official Hacknet Discord quite often. If you want to check that out, you can just search for it. And uh, yeah, go wishlist Russell Dunk on Steam. Uh, it'll be coming out pretty soon. Or on Switch. Probably better on Switch because HD Rumble is incredible. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Matt, for coming on the show and sharing all this great information. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. That was it for today, guys. Hope you enjoyed the episode. If you guys want to listen in on the upcoming episodes, then I suggest you guys subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to. It really supports me and motivates me to continue with the show. And of course, check out all of Matt's games on Steam. You'll find a link in the description, as well as anything else we talked about. Have a great week, and I hope you join me for the next episode.